Hi, Alan Stratton from As Wood Turns. Every wood turner develops an inventory of faceplates, big ones, medium ones, small ones. You tend to use them on a lot of different projects, but you also want to leave them on the project until the project is complete. And if you get multiple in process, that becomes a problem. Get more? Well, they're expensive also. Recently, I've evolved to using more wooden faceplates. It combines the scrap piece and the faceplate together into one thing. This one mounts to my scroll chuck, has a dovetail tenon on the back facing, and as I use it, I face it off and clean it up and then use it again. In this case, I've had to add another layer because I wore it down. But I never have to worry about hitting screws as I use the faceplate. That's a big plus in my book. But I've now taken it to a new dimension. I purchased a Beale spindle tap. This enables me to make threads that match my lathe's spindle. I started by experimenting with just small blocks and threading them. This is what I used to make this large segmented faceplate. I use this sort of thread as an insert to this faceplate. This is the pair of faceplates that I used for the bracelet. I needed two in that case because I built the bracelet from two different ends at the same time. These also mount into my scroll chuck as a convenience so that I can mix and match whenever I need. But the other useful accessory is this reverse chucking adapter. This also matches the threads on my lathe spindle so that the face plate can mount either on the spindle or on this reverse chucking adapter. So for the bracelet, I was able to put this one on my headstock, this one on the tailstock, bring them together to glue the final pieces together. What woods? Almost anything goes. I want inexpensive wood, hard wood, wood that will hold a grain. I made this one out of Baltic birch, three layers laminated together. It has the threads in the middle. It also enables to mount to my scroll chuck, either in contra contraction or in expansion mode. Between metal faceplates and wood faceplates, I'll, I'll be using a lot of wooden faceplates from here on out. But I'm going to keep my metal faceplates. These will be, I will definitely use for bowl turning, for the big green bowls, where I want the security and comfort of knowing there's a mass of steel holding my bowl together. But you say, Alan, there's a hole in the middle. Well, don't whine about that. If you don't like the hole in the middle, glue on another piece of wood. For this video, I'll demonstrate making this face plate out of poplar. Two inch, over six inches in diameter, also will mount to the chuck. Let's go and make ourselves a face plate. I've selected two inch poplar for this faceplate. I consider poplar a utility hardwood. Not great figure, not great color, but fairly inexpensive. I've prepared this six inch diameter disc by marking the center and cutting a rough perimeter with a bandsaw. Don't pre-bore the hole for the threads because they need to be perfectly centered. Best tool for this job is the lathe itself. Mount the plank on the face of the chuck with the jaws closed. The jaws will not fit on the wood, so just close them tightly on each other to form a solid base for the plank. Use the tailstock to center the plank and hold it to the chuck. I've done this many times with various woods and it works fine. Sometimes the wood spins a little on the chuck. When this happens, I tighten the tailstock a little more. If you don't have a scroll chuck to start with, borrow one. Metal faceplate would just be very difficult. I'll use my bowl gouge first to flatten the face of the plank, then to cut it round, and finally to trip the outer edge just a little. I'll attack the wood grain from the side, which avoids trying to cut end grain. I'll make the face plate mountable to the scroll chuck also. For this size face plate, this is almost a necessity to even make it. However, for a smaller face plate that can already fit into the jaws, it would not be necessary. Whenever possible, I would turn the tenon anyway. I'll size the tenon so that the threading tap will pass between the scroll chuck jaws when they're closed. This will make the job just a little easier by avoiding the need to flip the face plate to complete the thread tapping. This is because my tap is ta a tapered tap and does not cut a full thread clear to its tip. This helps in getting started but eliminates the possibility of tapping a thread that does not go clear through the block. 
I clean up the tenon with a skew in scraping position. Then to set up to drill the hole, first flip the blank over and mount at the squirrel chuck jaws with the tenon just created. While you're mounting the blank, mark where the jaws are seated and mark the number of the jaw on the wood faceplate. If you do mount the faceplate again in the squirrel chuck, you'll want to use the same positioning, including the same dents from the jaws. I'll use a 1 and 1 8 inch Forstner bit. This is the size required for a 1 and 1 quarter inch thread. Bore the hole at nearly the slowest speed available. This will avoid burning the bit and will generally be fast enough. If chips are not clearing, back the bit at, back out and clear the chips and go in again. If they're feeding out well, then go for it. Even at this speed, the bit will be hot when you're finished. It's not required, but I lubricate the hole with mineral oil and beeswax before cutting the threads. For tapping the threads, you'll need your tap. Mine is a beel tap. Also needed are vice grips and the tailstock's revolving center with a cone point. This point mates to a recess on the bottom of the tap to, to help keep the tap aligned. I lock the spindle with a large tool rest pressing on the lock bottom. I cannot use one hand to hold the button because I need both for the actual tapping. Start the tap into the hole. This is where the taper on the tap comes in handy. Grab the base with the vice grips or a large wrench. You'll need the leverage. Thread pitch on my tailstock is probably 10 threads per inch. I'm tapping at 8 threads per inch. This means that the tap rotation does not match the tailstock rotation. An exact match is not possible. If I push the tailstock too far, it binds the threading. When this happens, I just stop pushing the tailstock and keep threading. If the threading gets too far ahead, then a gap appears at the bottom of the tap between it and the revolving center. The purpose of the tailstock is not to push the tap, only to help keep it aligned to the hole. Once the tap breaks through, continue until the taper on the tap is fully exposed. Otherwise, the threads will not be fully cut. Then back out the tap the opposite way, again juggling the tap rotation against the tailstock rotation. I like to coat the finished threads with mineral oil and beeswax. This time it is for sealing and lubrication. Most spindles are not threaded clear to their base. Since I need to mount this side of the faceplate to the spindle, I'll cut about a 1 8 inch mortise around the thread hole, then a bit of a chamfer on the threads to allow them to start threading when mounting. For this I'll use a bedan, or I could use a skew or as a scraper. Again, this is only so that I can mount the faceplate from this side to do the same thing on the other side. Now mount the faceplate on the other side to do the same relief for the spindle. Finally, face off the new faceplate to prepare it for use. If you don't want the hole, then just glue on another layer of wood to cover it. You'll eventually glue on more layers anyway as the faceplate is refaced with each use. When it gets too thin, then add a layer and you're off and running again. Now I have plenty of faceplates and I can make a new one whenever I need it. Please like this video and add your comments below. Thank you.